Hi, everyone. Thank you for welcoming us into your home and a special hi to Aldergrove. I hope you're having a great Sunday. We're in our series about change before you have to. And today I want to talk about a story from the book of 2 Kings. Uh, it's about the widow's son. And I want to entitle this sermon, Everything's Fine. You know that First and Second Kings is written to the exiles. Do you remember that the children of Israel, the people who were living in the promised land, they were, they were uh, disobedient to the Lord. They were worshiping other gods. They had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten how to worship God. And so God allowed the ba Babylonians to capture them and take them away, uh, many of them, uh, for a period of time. And they were exiles in Babylon for about 70 years before they started to come back. And it was while they were in exile that they were to learn the lessons about how to truly become the people of God because they had forgotten. And uh, there's an example of a, a group of people that didn't change before they had to and suffered the consequences of neglecting the changes. And so the, birth, the books of First and Second Kings are written to those exiles and it's written to try to explain to them what happened to the people of God. Why were they taken into captivity? Uh, why did they lose the promised land? Uh, and what could they have done differently? And perhaps, is there any hope for a future for them uh, if they get their act together and begin to worship Yahweh and come back to him as uh, his chosen people? So this story in our text today in uh, Second, Second uh, Kings chapter 5 is about the Shunammite woman. Now, we don't know her name. We're not given her name. But... Uh, Elisha, the prophet of God, went her to her town to preach. Now, back in those days, because they didn't have the Holy Spirit uh, in individuals, God would uh, anoint certain individuals called prophets with the Holy Spirit, and they would be his representatives, and they would bring his word to the people, uh, his direction, his commandment, and they're often given an ability to do miracles in order to prove that Yahweh was more powerful than the other gods that they might be tempted to serve, the gods of the Canaanites. And so Elisha would be, as an itinerant prophet, going from town to town, uh, sharing the word of God, teaching them about the law, teaching them about who God was and the instructions. And, and so that's where our story picks up. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put him in a, a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. Well, let's pause and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for this story, this, this rather strange story of the Shunammite woman and all that happened to her. And, and help us to learn the lessons that, that you were trying to teach Israel about what it meant to be the people of God and what it meant to be faithful and what it meant to, to really follow hard after you. And Lord, I, I, I pray that um, this time of reflection and this time of uh, thoughtfulness over your word would speak deeply into our lives so that we would live lives that would, uh, well, produce change. Lord, that's what we want. We want to be changed and we want to become more and more like Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. So this lady, this well-to-do lady, shows Elisha some hospitality. And Elisha, being a gentleman, he asks her if he can return the favor. In fact, he says, could I speak to the king for, on your behalf? Could, is there anything that you would need uh, from the king? And, and her response is she basically says, Ah, no, thanks. I'm, I'm fine. I'm good with my family. Everything seems to be going well. And so then Elisha asked his servant Gehazi for a suggestion. You know, he's, he's kind of really wanting to, to do something nice for her. And he says, do you know anything that we could do? And, and his servant says, well, actually, she has no children and her husband is old. Now, this would mean in, in, in that age, you know, 800 years before Christ, that she had no provision if her husband died for her being a widow, she'd have no income, no ability to fend for herself. And uh, this is why they needed children to look after them in their old age. And so this would be a big problem in the future for her. And so Elisha promises her a child. And, and this is what it says. This is starting about verse 15. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, 
you will hold a son in your arms. Well, one day, that son, after a few years, gets very sick and dies. The child, here's the text, the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. Now, most scholars believe that what's happening here is that the son has uh, sunstroke, and uh, uh, the story continues from there. Uh, so his father told his servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat in her lap until noon, and then he died. Wow. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. Now, she doesn't tell anybody that the child has died. And then she rushes out to find the prophet. When her husband asks her why she's in a rush and why she wants to, leave to, to see the prophet, she, she has a strange answer. It says this way in verse 22 and following. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why do you go to him today? He asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. You see, what he says to her is, why are you rushing off to see the prophet of God? It's, it's not Sunday. It's not the usual times when we would talk to him. It's not the usual time that we would see him. And her response is, basically, everything's okay. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. That's a very strange reaction. And it's intended to, to strike us as the reader, as, as a strange reaction. Her son, her only child has just died. The one who had been promised, the one, the one who, who uh, miraculously had come into her life. And, and if you read through the story carefully, you find out when, when Elisha first promises this, she says, oh, don't get my hopes up. Don't get my hopes up. And, and, and when the child comes, now her hopes are up. She thinks everything's going to be fine. And now the child dies. What, what a disappointment. That's that's not most of our reactions to this isn't to say everything's fine. It's to say, oh no, what are we going to do now? Or how could God have allowed this to happen? Well, the text goes on. Because she rushes to see the prophet. The prophet sees her at a distance. And in Elisha, who tends to be a little emotionally unengaged with people, and we see that throughout the story, he, instead of going to see her personally, he sends his servant out to talk to her. And so here's the story. And later, when he saw her in a distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. <laughs> Here again, this is the third time in the story that she says everything's all right, that she's fine. The first time was when Elisha asked if he could ask for a favor for the king. And she said, no, nah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. Family's good. Nah, I don't need anything. And, and, and then her husband asks her when she's rushing away to try to get help for her son. And she says, no, everything's fine. I'm okay. And now the servant of Elisha asks her the same kind of question. Very specifically, is everything all right with your child? And, yeah, no, everything's all right. That should strike us as strange. And, and what the author wants to, to bring out a point by telling us this, this detail. It's, see, it's only when she speaks to, privately to Elisha that the whole story comes out. Uh, and then Elisha, uh, being a little emotionally unengaged, uh, sends his servant to pray for the child. And, and in doing so, she says, well, you know, read the story carefully. Uh, well, that's not quite not good enough, Elisha. I'm going to stick with you. We, you and I are going to go see this child. So she insists that Elisha comes with her and goes to see the child to pray for it. Well, the servant, Gehazi, goes to the child, prays for his feeling, healing. Nothing happens. And uh, then Elisha shows up on the scene. He's still dead, lying on Elisha's bed. And so then he begins to pray, and he, and he does something a little bit strange. Uh, this is the story from uh, about verse 34 and following. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Wow. An incredible story. 
Actually, if you've been reading through 1st and 2nd Kings, you'll notice that something very similar happened to uh, the prophet Elijah when another lady's son dies and uh, he revives him and he does the same thing. He lays on the, the child's body and the, the, the child comes back to life. So whether Elisha had heard this as a technique for <laughs> raising people from the dead, we don't know. We don't understand what's going on here. We just understand that there's this very strange occurrence and uh, this guy, this young man, this young boy comes back to life. Well, what are the lessons? Why are we told the story? Why are the exiles told the story? Well, I think first of all, we need to see that God rewards faithfulness. It's this woman's faithfulness to the uh, prophet of God and providing at her own expense a place for him to stay. You see, God always re rewards faithfulness. He always has and he always will. Not only is God good, we have to remember that God is also generous. In the New Testament, uh, in Luke chapter 6, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. Uh, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. We can't outgive God. When we are faithful, God rewards our faithfulness. If we're faithful in small things, he gives us more things to be faithful over. This is a principle of scripture. It goes through the whole Bible. It's, it's uh, listed again and again and again through the New Testament. God rewards faithfulness. Not only does God reward faithfulness, God, in fact, requires faithfulness. You know, uh, acknowledging certain facts about God and saying certain words about Jesus doesn't do it. And, and one of my concerns about the church uh, in the days in which we live is that I, I think there are scores of churchgoers who think that by acknowledging certain facts about God or certain facts about the Bible or saying certain words uh, about Jesus somehow saves them. Uh, well, that's never been the case. And it never will be the case. Uh, salvation does not come through simply uh, uh, memorizing certain, certain things about God or saying certain, certain things about Jesus. It really requires faithfulness. And, and faithfulness requires complete surrender of our lives. You know, I, I cringe a little bit when I hear new believers sometimes say, oh, uh, when they talk about um, receiving Jesus, they, they say something like this, oh, I made Jesus Lord of my life. Well, actually, you don't make Jesus Lord of your life. Jesus is Lord of your life, whether you acknowledge it or, or recognize it or not. In fact, I don't think Jesus needs us to make him Lord of anything because he is Lord of everything already. He is the creator and sustainer and redeemer of the world. Uh, perhaps more accurately to say, well, I have acknowledged his lordship in my life. And I think that's different than simply saying, well, I've made him Lord. Rather, it's acknowledging that he is Lord of our lives and cooperating with that lordship. And, and what, what he requires of his servants, what he requires of his people is not simply some um, expressions of, I know this about Jesus, and I say this about Jesus, I make these confessions, I, I go to church, I pray these prayers. He requires complete surrender of our lives to him. That's what makes him, enables him, and acknowledges him to be Lord of our lives. Well, this is what the children of Israel had to learn, and this is what we must learn, that, that faithfulness is required, that it's not enough to... Uh, say certain things or go through the rituals or go to church. Uh, we must be faithful to him. We must surrender our lives completely and totally to him. Well, well, secondly, what we see in the story and what the exiles had to learn, what we have to learn and keep in our minds is that our faith will be tested. Uh, endurance only comes one way. Perseverance only comes through to us one way. And, and this is through the tests and the trials and the challenges that we face. And, and, and I think we need to remember this particularly today in, in the age in which we live when, when we're raising our children. Because I think today um, there's a tendency to try to um, keep our children from experiencing any opposition or any difficulty or any challenges. I think there's a lot of kind of helicoptering, uh, uh, parental helicoptering of children. I, I notice this is uh, in teaching uh, that uh, I think more than ever before in the last few years, uh, parents are involved in even advocating for their children, for the marks, the grades that their children get in school. 
when I think back of my parents and, and my formal education and my uh, uh, schooling, my university training, my parents didn't have a clue the, the grades that I was getting. Or, and, and it would have been way, way beyond their realm of comfort to go to talk to a professor and to argue about grades that their students are getting. And yet this is happening today in universities and our colleges. And I think there's a tendency to perhaps... Um, overly protect our children from challenges. And unless they learn to deal with the challenges, they can't grow. They, they can't become gritty. They can't become strong. And, and in fact, as, as followers of Jesus in raising our children, we should, in fact, um, press our children about the tough issues that Christians face before the kids face them in, in high school, before the kids face them in university. As parents, we should be uh, pushing the kids to come up with good answers to well, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, how old is the earth? Another big question. Uh, is, uh, are other, all religions similar? Do, all, do they all say the same thing? Is there a good case for believing in the resurrection? We should be talking about tough issues to our kids so that, that uh, they become stronger because their faith will be tested. And you know what? When our faith is tested, when we can't hold on any longer, you have to remember that he holds on to us. Uh, this is a wonderful passage in James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Well, that's a tough thing to do. Because we know that in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the challenges, God is creating in us endurance and perseverance. And this, in fact, breeds in us hope, hope for the future. Well, I think also we need to talk about in, in this text where this, this woman keeps insisting that everything is fine. Is, is this denial? Is, is this, you know, kind of her, her uh, just saying, I don't believe it's really happened? Or is this a response of faith? And, and I really think that, that her reaction is a response of faith. That, that she knows where to run to. She knows that if she goes to the prophet of God, that Elisha will somehow solve her problem because this child of promise, this child that had been given to her, uh, that, there, that that was God's intent and God was going to follow through on it. You see, denial causes us to run away from problems, but faith helps us take the problems to Jesus. And, and I, I think that's one way of dis discovering whether we're in denial or whether we're responding faithfully. Are we running from the problem or are we running to Jesus? She takes the problem to Elisha. She ran to the prophet and we need to run to Jesus. I think that we always need to watch the direction that we run when we encounter difficulties and challenges in our lives. Are we, are we simply closing our eyes to them? Are we denying them? Are we saying they don't exist? Or do we instead say, no, I need to go to Jesus. I need to go to prayer. I need to seek godly counsel and deal with this in my life. Well, there are some important lessons that the uh, children of Israel and that we need to learn regarding uh, being faithful. Uh, he rewards faithfulness. He always has. He always will. Our faith will be tested. And yes, everything is fine. And we can just go back to that Romans 8, 28 passage that we looked at just a few weeks ago, where uh, the Apostle Paul is telling us that in all things, God works for the good. Yes, we can say by faith, everything is fine. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you that you are at work in our lives and that you allow us the privilege of changing before we have to. Help us to take the lessons to heart. Help us to learn to, um, to be faithful to you and not just say the right things, not just kind of uh, do the prescribed things that Christians do and go to church or go to Bible study. And Lord, I pray that we would totally surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would, that we would remember that from time to time our faith will be tested. And, and this is good because it increases our endurance and an endurance leads to hope. Lord, we thank you that uh, all is well with our souls, that uh, we can say unequivocally, we know that no matter what we're going through, no matter what's happening in our lives, we know that we're in your good hands. So we thank you for that, Lord. We pray that we would live that way in your name. Amen. 
Well, here's a question that we would like you to contemplate and some music will play in the background as you perhaps think about this. Is your tendency to run away from problems or to run to Jesus? Now, be truthful. Now, is this something you need to work on? Perhaps think and pray about that over the next few minutes. I'll come back with a concluding comment. Well, new immigrants face many challenges when they uh, come to Canada. I'm thinking of uh, people coming from Ukraine to Canada these days. And, and, and certainly, there more than that, we, we meet all kinds of new people coming to Canada. They face the challenges, perhaps, of new languages, the challenges with culture, challenges with customs, etc. It's a whole new way of life, and everything seems foreign to them. I remember a number of years ago talking to a, a Muslim man by the name of Sadagiana, Mr. Sadagiani, and um, he had come from Iran. He was a, a minister of education in Iran during the Shah's time, and when the Ayatollah took over with the revolution, uh, 23 of the 25 ministers of, of parliament were assassinated, and he had to get out of the country uh, at risk of his own life. He came to Canada, he's a, he's a devout Muslim man, and, and he he received Jesus into his life, and uh, he uh, acknowledged his lordship in his life. And I remember having a conversation with him as this, you know, he was a senior man, a senior Muslim man, and just talking to him about what it was like being raised in Muslim culture and what it meant now to live in Canada and, and what it meant to know Christianity. And he, he said to me that coming out of that environment, coming out of a Muslim environment, coming to Canada and, and understanding who Jesus was really helped him to see the Muslim faith in a totally different way. And, and he said what it helped him to understand is this primary difference between Christianity and Islam is that in Christianity, there's this tremendous emphasis on the love of God, the love of God for us and the love of God for one another. He says it's completely foreign to, to Islamic kind of faith. That that's, it's about uh, subservience. It's about um, yielding to the authority and the power of Allah. And Christianity is so indifferent. You see, it's the new environment that helped him examine his faith and his belief and helped him, to, helped him to see it in a totally different way. Well, I was thinking, isn't this perhaps what God is doing today in our world? Uh, when, when God has shaken our world through the whole COVID experience and now through what's happening in Ukraine, uh, could this be God's opportunity, uh, not that he's caused it, but an opportunity for him to help us get out of the old ways of thinking and into new ways so that we rethink how we are serving God, so we rethink how we are worshiping. Remember, the children of Israel yeah, didn't get it until they moved out of Palestine and they were kept in captivity in Babylon. It's then when they renewed their commitment to God, they renewed their commitment to covenant, to the law, and then they took that back with them and they rebuilt the temple and they became again 
became again the people of God. And so perhaps the challenges and the, the upset of the cultural things that are going on and, and, and the, the changes of our world are an opportunity for us to rethink our faith, to rethink what's really, really important. Well, I think that's an opportunity for us to change before we have to. Romans chapter 16, verse 26 and 27 is our doxology for this series. But now, as the prophets foretold and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.